Dear participants, dear experts, thank you for taking the time today to join us for the panel discussion on the current situation of ISIS affiliates being detained in Northeast Syria and the policies states are adopting towards the repatriation of women and children. Since 2019, ISIS associates and family members have been held in atrocious conditions in prison camps. The two largest are notably Al Hol and Al Raj, guarded by the Syrian Democratic Forces. We are going to discuss today state policies to deal with the situation, emphasizing re repatriation efforts. To illuminate this issue with their expert perspectives, we are delighted to welcome our three experts. Ms. Leda Taylor of Human Rights Watch, Ms. Sauli Mektebaeva of the UN Office of Counterterrorism, and Ms. Olia Imuradova, Director of the Barakor Hoyat NGO in Uzbekistan. This panel discussion has been organized by the Bulan Institute for Peace Innovations. The Bulan Institute is a research institute based in Geneva, Switzerland, with a regional office in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Our mission is to promote peace, security, human rights in Central Asia, Eurasia, and South Asia through research, advocacy, and dialogue. We will now move on to the presentation of our experts who will present their insights on the situation. We will follow their presentations with a question and answer session. The experts will be asked the questions provided by our participants. If you have a question to ask, please let us know in the Zoom chat on the right-hand side of your screen. I would like to add that our session is being live streamed to Facebook, will be recorded to share with our partners on social media, and will be posted on our website. To all participants, please keep your microphone and cameras off for the entirety of the panel discussion. Our first presentation will be from Ms. Letta Taylor. Ms. Taylor is the Associate Director and Terrorism Counterterrorism Lead of the Crisis and Conflict Division of Human Rights Watch. Ms. Taylor is an outspoken and impressive advocate for human rights and recently visited Al Hol and Al Raj camps. She has called upon states to repatriate their citizens and to provide more support to those in need. Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Taylor, and for providing your important perspective on this issue. Um, Ms. Taylor, how would you characterize the current situation in Al Hol and Al Raj, and how would you assess the current state approaches, particularly approaches from Western states uh, towards this issue? Thank you so much, and I, I'm really honored uh, to join uh, to join this uh, panel today to speak on this uh, critically important issue. Uh, I, I very much share the view of the the call of the Bulan Institute for repatriation as the only viable option to the quagmire to this Guantanamo in the making. Uh, where we have citizens from nearly 60 countries around the world, a majority of them children trapped in, in conditions that are degra deeply degrading at best and inhuman uh, and life-threatening in many cases. Um, I, the situation is dire, as Chopin um, began uh, her comments uh, by, by noting. I, and I will go into details about, about the situation, about the plight of these women and children. And also I would note men and, and, and uh, older boys who are being held in prisons and, and so-called rehabilitation centers. Um, and security is uh, decreasing by the day, but at the same time, we are seeing in an, a retrenchment. Uh, countries that do not want to repatriate are digging in their heels the, the, the worse the humanitarian situation and security situation becomes, the more uh, intent they seem to be to abandon their citizens to, um, to their fate uh, without trial, um, with, without due process. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a dire situation indeed. And I'd really like to start before I go into the situation in the camps by noting two pieces of very dire news. Uh, that that um, that have been reported just in the last few days. The first one was this morning, where in the in the United Kingdom, the Supreme Court ruled that Shamima Begum, uh, a woman who was only 15 
when she went to uh, Northeast to, to Syria uh, to join ISIS um, and uh, is not entitled to return to the UK to contest in person the revocation of her citizenship. Uh, Shamima is now 21 and has lost all three children uh, while living under ISIS and in, in one of the camps in Northeast Syria. Uh, the court also ruled that Shamima Begum, however, must contest the, her citizenship revocation in person, but there's no indication of when that will happen. So essentially this ruling perpetuates Shamima Begum's indefinite legal limbo, uh, including de facto statelessness and, 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 and does the same for many others who may be seeking to contest uh, revocation of their citizens of citizenship in these camps and prisons. So that is one piece of particularly dire news. The other, I think, really disturbing piece of news is that uh, in Al Hasika in northeast Syria, a ma massive expansion is underway for prisons for the male uh, the male prisoners, as well as a plan. A plan is also in the works for a rehabilitation center for uh, 500 youth. A lot of this is also funded by the UK, but also by the US. Now, of course, there is massive overcrowding in these prisons. And so we do need, um, I mean, if, until a solution is found and until there is repatriation, of course, prison conditions should be improved. But the intent of this appears to be to keep these foreigners who've never been before a judge, never seen a courtroom, never been charged with a crime indefinitely in Northeast Syria. And my assumption with this rehabilitation center is as male children grow too old to be in the camps, when they reach out adolescence, too old in the eyes of the authorities, they will be then warehoused in this rehabilitation center. So again, instead of finding solutions such as fair trials, um, whether in Northeast Syria or at home, the, what we're seeing is this pattern of building of, of semi-permanence, uh, turning, turning these camps and makeshift prisons in, in Northeast Syria into a Guantanamo uh, with, with, no, with no due process. Um, I, would, I would also like to note, and I imagine our speaker from the UN Office of Counterterrorism will, will go into this uh, more, but uh, that this retrenchment, this refusal on the part of dozens of countries, including most countries in the West, to repatriate more than a few token citizens comes despite growing calls from UN Secretary General, UN uh, Under Secretary General uh, Borenkopf, the head of the uh, uh, Office of Counterterrorism, Michelle Bachelet, the Human Rights Commissioner of the UN, uh, more nearly two dozen special procedures, meaning experts, of, of um, human rights experts at the UN to, who are all calling for repatriations of nationals and for states to, to take some kind of um, responsibility for these citizens who are, they are warehousing. Uh, so so uh, it's, a, it's a grim moment indeed. Um, what are countries, what are the conditions that countries are content to leave their nationals in? Well, uh, just to give you an idea, we're talking about 42,500 nationals, uh, foreign nationals in uh, Al Hol and Roche camps. Uh, these are women and children primarily. Um, more than half of this population is children. Now, a majority of these 42,500 uh, foreigners are Iraqis. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you set aside the Iraqis who are from a country neighboring Syria, uh, we're talking about about four, 14,000 um, non-Iraqi foreigners from nearly 60 countries. Of those, about 2,000 are men and older boys, although some are quite young, in prisons. And then we have about 8,000 women and 4,000 children. Most of these children are very young. They are living in dire conditions. There are wild dogs roaming Al Hall camp. The, the drinking water in both Roche and Al Hall is dirty, it's contaminated. There are food shortages, overflowing latrines, flimsy tents prone to fires and floods, almost no medical care. Hundreds of children have died, as well as women, in, uh, in these camps since 2019, particularly Al Hall. Many of them children who, 
who died of preventable diseases. Um, hundreds of prisoners have died in the, in the, in the prisons for, for the men and older boys as well. Most of these children have no schooling, no games, no recognized nationality, no hope, no nothing, um, which makes them fodder, that makes them ripe for exploitation by ISIS as they grow older if they are not removed promptly. It is no wonder that 10 French women recently began a hunger strike in Al Hall. Um, the humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate because of the closure of a, of a, um, a strategic border crossing in January 2020, uh, which the UN had uh, used to provide supplies and services to the region. Meanwhile, we have the spread of COVID with very little testing. Um, in our whole, ISIS appears to be gaining quite a bit of influence. In January alone, there were 20 deaths in the camp. Half of them were beheadings. Five of these 20 people killed were women. Um, there are, the situation is so unstable in Al Hol that um, many humanitarians are not even going in. Local security forces are overwhelmed. Human smugglers are helping scores of women and children escape, although many are then caught at the border, as we've seen with a case recently of an Australian woman who Australia then promptly revoked Australia then probably revoked her citizenship. Um, some, of these, some of these women and children are making it to the Turkish border, but others are simply disappearing. And where are they going? Are they being picked up by ISIS? Are they regrouping? And will men do the same if they manage to escape from prisons? Um, in Roche camp, which is smaller, the quality of the shelter is better. There is more electricity. However, there are significant restrictions uh, and women have complained there of having their Qurans taken and being uh, not allowed to wear their niqabs, of lack of medical care, and of an uptick in security incidents as well. Incidents as well. I'd like to read you something that one family member shared with me just the other day, uh, who has a who has a, a, a more than one relative in in Roche camp. He he told me when they first moved to Roche. These women, uh, several women were moved to Roche last summer from El Hall with their children. When they first moved to Roche, there was a promise of better medical supplies, but they can't now they can't contact their families much. The medical services have since then slipped away and bullying and harassment uh, by guards and by other detainees has come back. They're being very careful about what they send out. Sometimes I get messages in code that I can't understand or read. They hear gunshots around them. They can't drink the water because of the pollution from nearby oil refineries. Children are coming out with rashes and are threatening self-harm. Now this is in Rose, which is supposed to be the better camp. Um, on top of this, as I mentioned, uh, there is no legal process for any of these detainees, which means that all these children who are victims under international law, even if they're associated with, with armed conflict, are being collectively punished Meanwhile, potential war criminals uh, among these, the adult population of men and women are not even being prosecuted for particular crimes. And that is a slap in the face to victims of ISIS. So given all of this, uh, we, we, really are co we really believe that there should be a massive repatriation effort such as we've seen in Kazakhstan, such as we've seen in Uzbekistan, such as we've seen in Kosovo. And, and in fact, the US to its credit has also taken back its, its nationals um, with the exception of one woman whose nationality uh, is in dispute. Um, while we don't necessarily agree with the US on, on the nationality of that particular woman, Hoda Matana, we do, we do uh, laud the US for, for repatriating as Russia has, as Kosovo has, as Kazakhstan has, as Uzbekistan has, uh, and, and other countries. Um, uh, and we, we'd really like to see Western Europe step up to the plate because we see this immense hypocrisy. Uh, Western Europe says it cares about these, about uh, rights, freedoms, uh, and yet it does, and yet it's creating a second class of, a second tier of citizens for whom it thinks it's, it's perfectly appropriate to, to have no, no rights. Um, repatriations have slowed to a trickle um, from 2019 to, to 2020. 
and is even slower uh, so far in 2021. And again, I think there's only been about 100 repatriations so far uh, from Europe and a couple dozen, uh, maybe three dozen uh, to other Western countries. And that is, that is a shameful record. Um, what uh, the, Kurd the Kurdish authorities have spoken of plans to prosecute women locally, uh, but so far nothing has come of these efforts. They keep getting detained. Many countries say they're willing to repatriate ch young children, but not with their mothers, which, which violates the rights of the child to family unity. Uh, so the situation is grim indeed. Um, what are we calling, why are countries so intransigent? This was one question I was asked to answer. Well, I think it's political fear. I don't think it's an inability of countries to either repatriate. We've seen from, from Central Asian countries uh, and, and some countries uh, east of Western Europe, other countries uh, east of Western Europe, that um, it is perfectly possible. Yes, it's difficult, but it's possible to repatriate. So that excuse falls short. Um, so what's left, it's, and, and we also think that the numbers are manageable, particularly given that, that those who might uh, be eligible for prosecution are a very small number. The majority of these citizens are children. We also know that many, many people who joined ISIS have made their own way back to Western Europe. And while there are risks, and some of them have tried to commit attacks or have committed attacks, they're a tiny minority. So really Western Europe, and the West has the capacity to, to manage this population at home, but they just don't want to. Um, so what are we calling for? We're calling for repatriations, and we're making an argument, which I think Bulan Institute shares, that it is much safer, if security is the fear here, it is much safer to repatriate and manage this population at home in compliance with international law, repatriation, rehabilitation, reintegration, prosecutions as appropriate, monitoring as appropriate, again, in compliance with international law, that's much better than allowing this population to break out of prisons and camps, possibly regroup, children to be recruited by ISIS as, as they grow up. Um, the, the, from a security standpoint, a legal standpoint, and a moral standpoint, this is the only so solution. Um, I'm sorry, I've taken so much time. As you can tell, I, I feel a bit passionately about this. Just to conclude, I would say that we are facing, in my view, one of the greatest security challenges of our time. And I mean, the world is facing this challenge. Will Western countries do the right thing and repatriate their nationals and show that they have respect for human life, uh, freedom from torture, right to a nationality, right to a fair trial, that they respect these rights for all of their citizens, or only a few? Do they have a second tier of, of justice for Muslim terrorist suspects, including children, uh, which fuels the ISIS narrative? Or again, do they believe that rights are universal? There's only one tolerable choice here. The other choice is folly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. That was a really powerful uh, way of opening our conversation. And uh, yes, I think it's really important for us to understand uh, the consequences of these violations of the human, basic violations of human rights uh, that these people are experiencing. So thank you for giving us that perspective. Um, our second speaker is Ms. Saule Mekdebaeva, Program Management Officer for the United Nations Counterterrorism Center within the UN Office of Counterterrorism. Ms. Mekdebaeva has been a, a key coordinator and director for international projects in Central Asia for over a dozen years and is currently coordinating the implementation of the UN Global Program on Prosecution, Rehabilitation and Reintegration, PRR, in Asia. This program is designed to support UN member states to meet the requirements set out by the UN General Assembly and UN Security Council regarding the legal, safe and humane implementation of PRR strategies for individuals held on reasonable grounds for terrorism offenses. Ms. Mekdeb Baeva, thank you so much for joining us and for helping us understand the role that the United Nations is playing here. Uh, could you tell us how the UN Global Program on, on Prosecution, Rehabilitation and Reintegration is progressing 
and if states are actually implementing the recommendations of the program? And if so, and if it's successful, will it enable states to more easily repatriate and rehabilitate their ISIS affiliates? Thank you very much for inviting me to participate at today's panel. It's a great honor to speak today uh, with other uh, great panelists. And uh, it's a great honor also to represent the uh, office where I work, United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. It was mentioned already today. The work of office was mentioned and the work of uh, under General Secretary Varenkov was mentioned already. So I'm happy to, to, to tell you more about our work and what we are doing and what uh, particularly PRR program is doing, Persecution Rehabilitation and Reintegration Program is doing. Let me first uh, share my screen with you because uh, the PowerPoint uh, will tell you, will let me tell you more about our work. Um, I, I hope you see my screen. Great. Uh, so, uh, let me switch to the next slide. Yes. Uh, so do you see the next slide with the statistics? Great. So statistics was already mentioned uh, today many times, but maybe it's also good to remind uh, so somebody who is good with numbers and, uh, you know, pictures, probably is again reminding us how many people we are talking about. As it was already mentioned, uh, mo uh, almost half of the population are Iraqi nationals and uh, uh, almost 30% are uh, Syrian nationals, and we do have uh, third country nationals in the camp, in our whole camp. And uh, uh, the first repatriation uh, started in 2017, as you see on the right side of the slide. And this, it's already four years old then the first repatriation started, but we still have, uh, uh, as you see, we still have a lot of uh, third country nationals in the camps. It was a, a growth of repatriation in 2019, but unfortunately, mostly due to COVID reasoning. Uh, if you see on the numbers on the right uh, part of the slide, you see that it was a great decrease in, in number of repatriations. Indeed, uh, uh, some of the West European countries started repatriation in 2020, but the numbers are very uh, small. And uh, in reality, there are four champions here who whose numbers of repatriation are quite high. 85% of repatriation goes to Uzbekistan, Kosovo, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And as it was already mentioned, uh, the, the COVID situation is, is, a, is a great uh, problem. It's even worsened the situation in the camp. And uh, recently, the Syrian Democratic Forces announced that they will be releasing uh, and they will be announcing general amnesty to de-identify the number of uh, people in the camps. And if you read the, the news reports, you already have seen that that this process of amnesty has started. And uh, I think this week it was 1,500 Syrian nationals released as part of, the, of this amnesty according to media, uh, media reports. Again, this is a complex of uh, three main problems and concerns. Humanitarian, as it was already mentioned by Ms. Taylor, human rights concerns, of course, uh, which comes first. And, um, security concerns. And it was already mentioned a lot about human rights situation and humanitarian day situation in, in these camps, but also it's a great security concern and uh, not only uh, for inside the camps, it's also a great security concern uh, beyond the territory of the, of the camps, because indeed, the, in many cases, repatriation has started already, but in many cases, uh, it is uncontrolled return, and uh, um, unfortunately, uh, no measures are provided after self retainees reach the country or their region. Uh, I think it was already mentioned a lot. Let me switch to the main question, which was asked about our program. But before I do that, let me also quickly highlight uh, different stakeholders here, because we are basically talking about three, four 
main stakeholders in this process of repatriation. It is, of course, uh, we're talking about member states and their responsibilities. It was mentioned a lot today, but I also want to remind that legal framework is there and the responsibility is very clear to repatriate their citizens. And uh, there are lots of UN Security, Country, UN Security Council resolutions on this regard together with the UN conventions. Uh, and uh, repatriation, uh, preparation for repatriation is the responsibility of the member states. And of course, uh, after repatriation, the prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration should start. And it's also a responsibility of the member states. What civil society or UN entities can do is uh, assist to this process, assist in preparation of public opinion, assist in a uh, process of rehabilitation. And uh, I know a lot of civil society which are already engaged into this uh, process. And I know countries where it should be better uh, process should be better organized in terms of uh, all of society approach. Uh, but the main responsibility we should remember should go and should be implemented by member states. What you know CT is doing, we are, as it, is, as it was already mentioned, we are raising awareness, we are sharing best practices, uh, lessons learned. Uh, we are we are trying to, to support the process of repatriation, but the, the process itself uh, is purely bilateral process and the UN can only support this process. Uh, at the end of the day, it is a political will of the member state. Uh, what exactly PRR program is doing is highlighted by Yellow Square. It is mostly assistance in risk assessment. It's guidance in terms of leg uh, legal guidance. It is coordination through different programs and uh, coordination of different uh, UN entities support because there are many UN entities which are working on this area. And our mandate is coordinate this work and uh, of course capacity building and and supporting it's also part of our responsibility and this is what PRI program is doing if if you look at this next slide you can see that the major aim of this program is uh, coherent tailored and balanced PRI strategies to be implemented all around the world and as you see we have three main outcomes as I mentioned already coordination uh, guidance and uh, capacity building pro programmatic delivery and uh, what, what differs our work from other UN entities is that we are working on the spheres where we, there is currently gaps on the ground. And uh, we are working to act nimbly to respond to the, to the acute needs of the member states and to leverage partnership of different UN entities on the ground. So the major uh, task of this problem of this program is guidance, as I said. So what kind of guidance uh, are we doing right now? Major guidance documents are listed here. It is PRR compendium, which is under development right now, and it will be uh, launched. It will be presented this year. It is guidance to work uh, under the Violent Extremist Prisoners Project. Uh, this project is uh, managed by myself. I am specialized on violent extremist prisoners. And uh, of course, we are working also on, on the field of uh, launching different uh, e-courses for both specialists and practitioners who are involved in prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration. This is in part of the guidance work. But we also do capacity building. And capacity building usually is based on the request which we receive from member state. And if you see on this map, uh, there are not so many requests currently, but still we have a number of uh, programs which we are implementing in different uh, parts of the world where we support, uh, where we help uh, to build capacity of the national practitioners based on a request from the member state. Uh, the major uh, achievement of this program right now, it is uh, this new modality, which uh, was developed last year. It is called Global Framework. Under this Global Framework, uh, we used our mandate and we convened different uh, UN entities. Altogether, we have 15 different UN entities integrated under all of UN response and the global framework was particularly launched to 
to support the member states with individuals returned from Syria and Iraq because we have PRR problems related to different uh, different regions. So for this uh, uh, for this global framework, we have two major uh, pillars: the uh, security and the accountability pillar, which is chaired by us by UNOCT, and we have also development and recovery pillar, which is ch shared by UNICEF, and uh, the major task of this global framework is right human rights based age and gender sensitive tailored response to the returning individuals individuals from uh, Iraq and Syria. As you see, uh, we have all UN entities responsible uh, for different parts of the work related to to individuals returned and uh, what we are doing is uh, basically uh, these major directions. Um, we are doing um, assessment, scoping exercise. Based on this assessment and scoping exercise, we are providing capacity building assistance and uh, we are offering robust risk assessment and uh, risk management and minimum condition for UN entities and for UN actions. And um, this all is uh, implemented in close cooperation with uh, UN country teams and uh, UN entities working on the ground. Uh, currently, we are launching global framework uh, program in Central Asia, mostly it will be for Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and uh, we are launching this program for Iraq as well. Of course, we depend a lot for, uh, we depend a lot on um, uh, on donorship support, but uh, what we have right now is quite, uh, is quite uh, uh, high interest to this program and uh, I hope that uh, during the next meeting we will be able to announce already the, uh, the results of the program which are at the stage of launching right now. I hope I answered it on your question on what kind of support we are providing and what kind of assistance we are providing to member states and um, over to you Cooper. Thank you very much uh, Ms. Mekhtabayeva. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation and yes, effectively giving us a great introduction to uh, the PRR and how the UN is involved. I'm very happy about the developments of the global framework and hopefully they are effective moving forward. Our next speaker is Ms. Olia Ilmuradova, director of Barcaror Foyat, an NGO facilitating the rehabilitation and reintegration of returnees from the Middle East in Uzbekistan. Barkaror Hoyat has been a key component of the Uzbek rehabilitation and reintegration process, and it provides us with a great example of the key role that local NGOs play in linking returning individuals to their communities. Ms. Ilmoradova intimately knows the details of Operation Mare, the repatriation operation Uzbekistan started in 2019 to bring home Uzbek citizens from Syria and Iraq. In order to use our time wisely, we pre-recorded Ms. Ilmoradova's presentation in Russian and our colleague, Ms. Alina Polyakova has been kind enough to provide us subtitles. Ms. Ilmoradova will be available in our Q&A session with translations provided by Ms. Polyakova. Thank, thank you, Olia, for being here. So I'll begin the presentation uh, that we recorded previously with Ms. Imorado. Здравствуйте, уважаемые друзья, коллеги. Большое спасибо за возможность участия на вашем мероприятии, за приглашение и то внимание, которое вы уделяете нашему региону. Я являюсь директором Международного социально-просветительского центра Баркарор Хайот, Узбекистан. И хотела бы рассказать вам о той работе, которую мы проводим в рамках реабилитации и реинтеграции женщин и детей, вернувшихся в зон военных конфликтов, или, как мы еще говорим, террористических. Как бы всего в Узбекистане. В рамках было, было проведено три гуманитарные акции. Мехар-1, Мехар-2, Мехар-3. Мехар переводится на узбекского, на русский, как добро. 
В рамках мехра, первого мехра было возвращено 56. А в рамках программы Мехар-2 были возвращены только здесь. А, и недавно, вот в конце прошлого года, у нас была по третья операция Мехар-3 и смогли вернуть 90 метров. Так это же. А сейчас обсуждается и готовится следующая программа Мехар-3. Возможно, это тоже будет самое ближайшее в будущем. А, кроме э, тех э, как бы выше перечисленных операций, у нас в Узбекистане есть еще достаточно большая группа, мы называем их самовозвращением. Это лица, которые добровольно приняли решение вернуть. Да? А, по их как бы чуть более 400 человек, это тоже женщины и дети, но у них есть мужчины, которые вернулись. В основном они возвращались на основе добровольного принятия решения при помощи консульских служб Министерства иностранных дел Республики Пакистан. Основные страны, из которых они вернулись, это Турция и Афганистан. Среди них было более 20 мужчин. В основном, конечно, многие из них осужденные террористы. Процесс самовозвращенцев тоже был достаточно несложный. Они обращались с прошением о помиловании на имя президента. И после проведения этих всех процедур им предоставлялась возможность вернуться. Кроме того, конечно, очень часто задают вопрос по поводу того, какие мероприятия именно со стороны правоохранителя меняются. Как бы есть, конечно, женщины, многие из них являются условно осужденными и находятся на контроле согласно процессуальному. Но поскольку ко всем это как бы именно политическая воля нашего государства, к ним был применен такой гуманный подход, но тем не менее в случае возникновения лицензии, они могут понести и уголовное наказание. А, к счастью, за период нашей работы, нашей практики, таких случаев не наблюдалось. Наша организация начала работать с этой целевой группой с конца 2017 года. То есть это было далеко до того времени, когда были сделаны эти гуманитарные акции как у нас в Казахстане. То есть это, это были группы самого. И как бы основополагающим, на наш взгляд, и самым успешным является то, что а, в рамках этой работы у нас построено очень устойчивое межсекторальное межведомственное взаимодействие. Потому что невозможно проводить такую огромную работу, а, не создавая устойчивый механизм социального партнерства. А, в рамках значит утвержденных, утвержденного порядка у, утвержденного порядка у нас в Узбекистане как бы создана рабочая группа при кабинете министров, в которой входят различные министерства, ведомства, общественные организации, которые должны и вовлекаются в эти процессы. Поэтому как бы наша организация является единственной негосударственной организацией в составе которые непосредственно не просто участвуют в этой группе, но в принципе и как бы разрабатывают вот такие основные направления, компоненты и вообще как бы можно сказать даже политику а, в этих вопросах. И я считаю, что та модель, которая создана у нас в Узбекистане, это пример реформ многих бизнес, в том числе и силовых, когда многие компоненты, особенно вот именно а, то, что касается реабилитации и интеграции, они передаются в институте гражданского общества. Одна из таких, как бы, одна из подцелей этого большого направления, это именно та политика, которая проводится у нас в Узбекистане, о либерализации а, многих силовых структур, гуманного подхода к целевым группам. И как бы это тоже очень положительно влияет на то, что снижает стигма дискриминация по отношению к нашим целевым группам. 
Поэтому наш центр является пока единственным профильным центром из, из институтов гражданского общества, который осуществляет эту работу. Мы начинали эту работу на территории Сухандаринской области. То есть мы являлись областной организацией, но в 2020 году было принято решение о прохождении нового этапа перерегистрации. Мы статус международного социального очень часто задают вопрос, то есть, как, вообще это, как вообще эта модель создавалась. То есть наша модель, которая у нас работает в Узбекистане, это модель моей семьи. То есть все процессы, которые проводят женщины и детьми, создаются внутри самой семьи. И создаются какие-то дополнительные там, биоты или шелтеры, которые достаточно дорогостоящие по своему содержанию. А все эти процессы осуществляются внутри семьи и непосредственно самими членами семьи. У нас в числе значит, наших бенефициаров есть различные э, семьи. Это, например, семьи дети и мама. Есть семьи, это, например, Аркуни. В рамках программы «Мехно-2» вы знаете, вернулись в регион. В основном все эти дети а, были переданы, переданы членам семей. Бабушки, дедушки, тети, дяди. Поэтому как бы матери остались в раке отбывать как бы, свой срок наказания. В Термесском центре прошли реабилитацию, проходят реабилитацию на разных этапах. В настоящее время 22 семьи и, 64, и в том числе 64 ребенка. Все они находятся на разных этапах реабилитации. Это связано с тем, что они все возвращались в разное время. Модель как бы, реабилитации, она вообще состоит у нас из трех этапов. Первый этап – это возвращение. Второй этап – активная реабилитация. И третий – это пассивная реабилитация. Каждый процесс, он а, имеет свою как бы, значимость, и в то же время они очень связаны с собой, между собой. То есть, если мы говорим о первом этапе возвращения, то есть это такой, мы его называем этап еще скорой помощи. То есть очень важно на этом этапе а, наладить, а, как бы сделать первичную оценку тех потребностей, которые есть. Это этапы документирования, это прохождение геномной экспертизы для некоторых а, мам, которые вернулись а, без каких-либо документов со своими детьми. В основном это касается группы самовозвращения. А, это вопросы а, жилья, если есть такие проблемы. Это вопросы медицинского медицинской помощи, то есть каждый ребенок и женщина, они проходят целый цикл вот таких медицинских программ для того, чтобы выявить, есть ли какие-то проблемы, если эти проблемы выявляются, как бы они лечатся. На фазе активной реабилитации, а тут уже а, идет более такая плотная программа, то, что касается отдельно, причем эти планы разрабатываются для женщин и отдельно разрабатываются для детей. Но все эти планы так или иначе пересекаются с другими членами. Потому что очень важно счастье. В этом и смысл нашей модели. Если человек, который возвращается оттуда, он должен знать, что его кто-то ждет. И это очень хорошо, когда есть семья, которая его ждет. И, соответственно, вот эти программы, когда мы решаем по приоритетности, что важнее на этом этапе, что можно отложить на более поздний срок, эти решения в основном применяют, принимаются вместе с другими членами семьи. И это очень важно. И третий этап – это свободное плавание. Мы его так называем. То есть это когда прошли основные фазы активной реабилитации, когда женщины получили профессию, когда часть из них только устроилась формально, какая-то часть на какую-то часть распространяется такая программа, как программа самозанятости, потому что многие женщины имеют до пяти, если у нас есть семья, где есть и семь детей, конечно, достаточно сложно ей находиться на работе, допустим, с девяти до шести или там, ну, бывает разное формат рабочего времени, соответственно, им гораздо удобнее получить какую-то профессию, благодаря которой и получить ресурс необходимый для того, чтобы создать эти условия себя на дому. И это, поверьте, не очень успешно работает. И у нас, например, 14 женщин занимается вот этим семейным бизнесом. Это очень положительно сказывается на их экономических возможностях. 
Соответственно, когда очень часто задают вопрос, какой срок занимает вообще сама, сама программа реабилитации, достаточно трудно ответить, потому что это очень индивидуально. Это очень индивидуально, и, соответственно, есть большая проблема устойчивости наших программ. Да? И я так думаю, что те мои коллеги, которые тоже работают в этой сфере, они тоже, наверное, делились такими проблемами, что это очень важно, что это, на мой взгляд, программа должна хотя бы рассчитана быть не менее чем на два года. Но это наши как бы, мнения, которые исходят из, из того опыта, который есть у нас. Я, очень, я уже выше говорила о том, что очень важно это партнерство. Соответственно, каждый партнер в этом процессе имеет одинаковую роль. Партнеры – это система образования, система здравоохранения, это система социальной, социального обеспечения. То есть, например, на детей, которые вернулись без сопровождения своих родителей, оформляется патронат. То есть это такой широкий спектр процедур и широкий спектр действий, которые так или иначе имеются в мандате разных организаций. То есть и именно та модель, которую мы создали, это такая... Это такой завершенный цикл, когда человек попадает в этот круг, он проходит через все вот эти инстанции, причем а, это происходит очень быстро, потому что а, каждый четко понимает, что, это, что в этом процессе не должно быть каких-то перерывов или каких-то сбоев. Соответственно, а, поэтому этот такой, когда человек проходит весь этот завершенный цикл, получается на выходе а, он получил все то, что на наш взгляд является и его тоже взгляд, конечно, тоже, и мнение обязательно учитывается, что этот человек получил все, что ему было необходимо на данный момент. Очень хотела бы отметить большую и выразить огромную благодарность тем донорам, которые нас поддержали, особенно это агентство ООН по миграции, международной по миграции, которое именно предоставляло такую помощь в виде предоставления оборудования для самозанятых для этих женщин. Это было очень важно, потому что каждая из этих женщин, которая получила эту возможность, она сейчас, это, и эта модель сейчас работает. Огромное спасибо ЮНИСЕФ, который также поддержала нас. Well, uh, it seems that the end of the video has been cut off. I apologize for that. Um, in any case, we got uh, a core part of the presentation. In any case, it really gave us a very good idea of how the operation is conducted on the ground, broken down mission by mission. Uh, truly fascinating. Thank you very much, Ms. Il Muradova. Um, now that we have played the video, we will now move on to our question and answer session. As we said before, these questions were asked from our participants in the Zoom chat. Our first question, uh, our first question is for Ms. Taylor. Uh, why are European countries only trying to repatriate children, uh, not only orphans, but those living uh, in camps with their mothers? EU countries are basically targeting these children surgically and trying to remove them from their mothers, from their families. Uh, we have information that recently some countries propose to the women to send back their children without, um, without them coming. So how would you comment on this issue? How do you see this issue evolving and why do EU states take that approach? Thank you. And I, I just want to also say first how I, I thought that the, the two presentations that followed me were, were fascinating and I, I've learned so much from them. So I want to express my gratitude to my, to my uh, fellow panelists uh, for their comments. Uh, on Yes, we, have, we are seeing a dangerous um, trend of countries not only preferring to uh, bring home orphans and uh, children with, with dire humanitarian needs, children in, in need of urgent medical assistance, but also, which is understandable, obviously, um, 
uh, and I, I, I commend them for, <laughs> for wanting to bring those children home. But, but then what we're seeing now in the second phase uh, with most orphans, not all of them, but many orphans and children in dire humanitarian need um, being repatriated, what we're seeing now is an attempt to kind of pick off the children from the parents and bring them back without the mothers. Uh, why do countries do this? Uh, because uh, there is this, in my view, uh, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball into the, the mentality of, of, of uh, Western governments, but there seems to be a view that, uh, the, that this is a politically toxic population, uh, that there is zero tolerance for the returns of these nationals. And even with children, we're seeing how difficult it is. It took Canada um, well over a year to agree to repatriate one five-year-old orphan <laughs> who I think was six by the time she was returned or she was four and then finally turned five. One orphan uh, under the administration of Justin Trudeau who has championed human rights. Why should it take so long? So the, the, now there is this, this view that this entire population is toxic, uh, but that the adults are particularly so. My argument uh, to states is that uh, obviously the rights of the child uh, emphasize the need, the preference for family unity. Now, there may be exceptional cases in which it is not in the best interest of the child to be with a parent, but we should not assume that every mother in Al Hol and Roche camp is not a good mother. Some of these women were groomed, some of them went over, made a terrible mistake, regretted it. I'm not saying all mothers may be fit uh, to take care of their children uh, who are being detained in Northeast Syria, but surely many are. These cases need to be examined one by one. And certainly if the mothers need to be monitored or, or imprisoned, that can be done at home in, an, in a facility where the child can still visit. Far better for the child to return to a home country, in some cases, a country that the child has never even lived in, <coughs> and have some access, continuity to family. So um, I, I think countries have a lot to learn from Central Asia in terms of messaging. Uh, Operation Goodwill, these are humanitarian evacuations. These are rescue operations. Um, uh, that are meant to save the lives of citizens. And I think rather than referring to children and adults as time bombs or ticking time bombs, that this is, this is the approach that needs to be made. Thank you, Ms. Taylor for that response. And we had a, we actually had a discussion last week also focusing on children. And one of the big takeaways from that discussion is children should be viewed first and foremost as children. Um, and human beings should be seen as human beings. Um, Saole, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, so a lot of this support that you were talking about uh, was targeted towards a diversity of different countries, but we saw that on the map that you showed us that there was capacity building occurring in Central Asia. Uh, do you have any insight into how that capacity building was expressed, how it was taking place? Was there interaction with civil society actors? Uh, more generally, or is it very much focused on government institutions? So, as I said, uh, this is uh, part of the local framework, and the, it, this is launching right now. We do have already some capacity building activities in Central Asia, even before we launch a uh, global framework. Uh, this is mostly support through our global program on uh, work with children affected by FTF phenomenon. And this is mostly uh, was implemented in Tajikistan. Uh, but this program will have also activities in uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan uh, in upcoming activities, uh, for example, even in March, uh, very soon. And most of these activities, they do include civil society uh, representatives, civil society organizations representatives. Um, we see clear interest uh, to, the, to the issue. Uh, particularly to the issue of uh, post repatriation rehabilitation programs. It is clearly lack of um, 
lack of uh, expertise on some issues related to work of psychologists, uh, psychiatric assistants, and uh, also interest to community-based rehabilitation programs. Uh, but also, it is a lot what we can already take from Central Asia. There are a lot of uh, experience its experience is huge. Uh, lessons learned are lessons learned are already there, and uh, we during these capacity building exercises, we already already see uh, positive examples or lessons learned which can be helpful in terms of avoiding some some practice uh, for other countries. And what we do as part of uh, what we plan to do as part of uh, um, global framework is uh, uh, the study which will try us to get lessons learned from all Central Asian countries, not only in terms of those, uh, in terms of rehabilitating people who were repatriated, but also the programs which, which are existing for self-retainees, because sometimes also um, the self, and it was already mentioned today that number of self retainees is also very high in the region. So uh, we, we are on the initial stage of this program. Uh, we do have already some events we have already implemented. Uh, what the positive side of, of this implementation is governments and me member states and uh, local governments, municipalities, everybody is quite interested in, uh, in getting new knowledge and and uh, in getting support. Uh, so far, it is going well, implementation. Uh, but what we see also, it is lack of exchange of experience. Even if we are talking about two different districts of the same country, sometimes we can clearly see that uh, the exchange of information is not existing. Sometimes positive examples are existing in, uh, in this, own, this particular country, but they are not uh, well known. And I also agree with uh, with Miss Taylor when she says, uh, in terms of the communication, Central Asia provides great example how it was communicated. Uh, the the governments of Central Asia used uh, the the used the uh, you know the great reasoning in terms of involving relatives and families into this uh, public discussion, and they used the the uh, the this tool of interviewing the relatives, providing information about uh, their families uh, still living in the countries. So, I mean, uh, indeed, it was a great communication example how um, emphasizing humanitarian aspect of this problem helped them to, to avoid and to overcome the persistence which existed among uh, society. Over to you, Cooper. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. It would be great to continue, but hopefully we can uh, contribute in a small way to having that discussion, bringing these people together that really need to have a conversation as to how we respond to this complex issue. Um, I would like to thank uh, especially our experts, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Mekhtabayeva, and Ms. Imoradova for their professional insights, for the fascinating views and for the fascinating information that we got to hear, as well as the work that they are currently doing on the ground and uh, around the world to really help these people and to try to improve the situations. Uh, your contributions really enrich this discussion, and I hope that the participants were able to take away some really interesting insights and information that they can carry forward. I would like to thank the participants as well uh, for having joined us and for taking the time to engage with our experts. Uh, we will be hosting more of these dialogues in the future, so stay tuned to the Bulan Institute. If you like this dialogue, please inform your friends and partners and don't hesitate to reach out to us. In the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful day wherever you may be, and we look forward to hosting events with you in the future. <laughs>